Closure is, is a long ways away for those families, and, and that's a, that tragedy can't be overstated, right? Um, if we help along the way to give people the information they need in order to move it forward, then, then we did our job. After more than a week of searching, investigators have found the wreckage of that float plane that crashed into the waters off the Washington coast more than a week ago. Ten people were killed when that plane went down, including two local women from right here in Spokane. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us here on Crime 2 News First at 4. I'm Whitney Ward. Tonight we are still waiting to find out when crews will be able to remove that float plane that crashed near Whidbey Island. The National Transportation Safety Board says it found the wreckage nearly 190 feet underwater. Right now the NTSB released these images of the wreckage sitting there on the floor of the Puget Sound. A team from the University of Washington used a special sensor device to scan the sand at the bottom of Mutiny Bay. The NTSB says it's now working to locate a remotely operated vehicle, which is likely to be what is needed to remove the aircraft and bring it back up to the surface. But among those killed was an activist, a leader and a beloved sister, Sandy Williams and her partner, Patricia Hicks, both died in that crash. Today on what would have been Sandy Williams 61st birthday, the community is coming together to celebrate the life and legacy of one of Spokane's strongest leaders. It's, it's, it's a terrible loss for this community. She really did want to carry a lot of people. Not many people want to do that. We've been partners in crime since we were born. It was Sandy and I against the world. When she got an idea, she worked it through. She made it happen. She took the time and the energy and had the fire and the passion to see it to fruition. So she's always been like that. She worked on so many levels, it's hard for the average person to even understand. There wouldn't have been a Carl Maxey Center without her. She did bring black people together, to bring all people together, and for us to support each other. The specifics of she did this, she did this, knew a lot of that, but that's not what she was about. What's really been touching our hearts is how people said she made them feel. I knew some, some of it, but you, I didn't know the magnitude. And so those kind of responses that have come in have been the one that, sorry, um, have touched me the most. She was such a great person. She inspired so many people. It's always comforting for other people to know that there's someone like her in the community and right around the corner. Found her place in a community where um, it was, it was um, in need of a voice for those that were underrepresented. So I hope people remember that. In addition to that person that was fighting the fight, you also had a very amazing woman who found a terrific partner in Patricia. We just didn't lose one, we lost two important community members here. Patricia was also a beautiful person. She would just want uh, those of us who were touched by her to pick up, pick up the flag, pick up the lantern, and try to keep the, keep the light shining in the right direction. So Sandy Williams Memorial is set to begin at 5 o'clock this evening. It is at the First Interstate Center for the Arts in downtown Spokane. We will be live streaming inside that event for those who are unable to be there in person. And we are going to continue our coverage of that memorial in her honor throughout this evening. Coming up tonight, how Sandy Williams also worked to spearhead Spokane's only black newspaper. And at 6, we'll have more from tonight's memorial. Switching gears now, though, this is a live look outside, and you can see the haze still sitting over our city, but an improvement over yesterday. Right now, there are still air quality alerts in place across Spokane and much of the inland northwest. The air has been unhealthy to breathe basically since Sunday. It reached into the very unhealthy category last night, but it has improved slightly today. So at this hour, the AQI sitting right there at about 160, or actually it looks like it's even less. Um, right now, so 124 it looks like it says. So you can see on the map everywhere in the red zone is unhealthy. Purple is very unhealthy, but if we're in orange, unhealthy for sensitive groups, that is certainly an improvement. So our chief meteorologist Jeremy Lagu has been tracking where all the smoke's been coming from, how long it's expected to stick around. You knew it was going to improve today, but not completely clear out quite yet. Yeah, that's kind of where we're at. Uh, quick update on some of those numbers you were just talking about. It looked like we had well pennant pulled up, not Spokane. Here in Spokane, we actually are at about 160, a 158 if I'm uh, 
getting down to the nitty gritty. So we do sit at a 158. That is unhealthy, unhealthy. And we do start to improve a little bit later on this evening. Right now we are seeing improvements compared to yesterday because we got rid of a little bit of cloud cover. Sun shines through, heats up the ground. All of those particles rise. So we get this little layer right down near the ground where we're not really breathing some of that. But just to show you the map that Whitney was trying to show you, Eastern Washington, as you make your way not even that far out to the west, you are in that unhealthy for sensitive group. So we're kind of right on the edge of it, but everywhere we are still under those air quality alerts. Those remain in effect through at least 2 p.m. tomorrow, but it does look like we start to get some improvement. Let's talk that improvement quick because it's a predominantly westerly wind that winds up blowing a lot of this out. So by the time we get to tomorrow, it looks like we do see much healthier air across the region. And that comes with the chance of some showers and storms that move in tonight. Coming up in the full forecast, we'll talk those. All right, sounds good, Jeremy. Thanks for clarifying all that for us. In the meantime, viewers, you guys have been sending us pictures of what all the conditions look like near you. You can see the haze affecting a lot of people in a lot of places across the Northwest tonight. And wildfires across the region, that's the main reason we are seeing so much smoke. One of those includes the Kootenai River Complex fire near Bonners Ferry in North Idaho. That fire continues to grow right now. It's burned almost 20,000 acres and is still considered 0% contained. There are no evacuations in place. However, those living on West Side Road have been placed in the set fire evacuation status, meaning they need to be getting ready to leave at a moment's notice if conditions change. And the Coeur d'Alene Fire Department is now prohibiting all outdoor recreational burning because of the poor air quality across the area. This comes after the Idaho Department of Environmental Quality issued an open burn ban in much of North Idaho. Propane fires and propane fire pits are still allowed. If you have any questions, you're encouraged to contact your local fire department. And for the most up to date information about the air quality and of course all those wildfires that are burning in our area, just text the word weather to 509 448 2000. We'll send that link directly to your phone. In other news tonight, the person who was shot and killed at Franklin Park in North Spokane last month has now been identified. That shooting happened at the end of August. One person was killed and four others were shot. 22 year old Ablos Kios was killed when he was shot in the head. Spokane police say that shooting took place right near the playground area. They say a fight had broken out at the park before that shooting. If I recall, it was about 3 a.m. when it happened. This was one of a series of late night shootings in Spokane Parks last month. So far, though, no arrests have been made. And it has been nearly a year since the Almira School Building was utterly destroyed in this fire. That was last October, if you recall, and it left that community fractured, scattering kindergartners across eighth graders to new schools miles away from home. And since the school fire, Almira's elementary and middle school students have been learning in portables. They started their second school year on that temporary campus three years ago or three weeks ago, rather, but they won't be there for much longer. Creme 2's Amanda Rowley toured the temporary campus in Almira today and gives us an update now on that new school building in the works. I am standing on what used to be Elmira's football field. Now it's a temporary campus for the town's elementary and middle school students. Right next door is the site of the original school building that was destroyed in a fire last year. As you can see, construction for the new building is underway. The Elmira School District secured $13 million from the state to rebuild the school. The new building will be much bigger at about 50,000 square feet with a second story, a larger gym and cafeteria. District leaders say the goal with this project is to make the most out of a bad situation. They expect this new building will be the gem of the northern Palouse. The Elmira community is grateful for the outpouring of support in the immediate aftermath of the fire that burned down the community's only school building. Meantime, students and staff are looking forward to moving in to their new school building when it opens next fall. Reporting in Elmira, Amanda Rowley, CREM 2 News. Already looking forward to it. All right, still to come, as the Spokane population grows, the city council is stopping construction in certain parts of the city. Why they want to halt more residential buildings near US 195 in West Spokane after the break.